Welcome, everyone. This is Disruption Talks. And I will start as any person should start when they're telling a story to make sure that it's relatable. So I'm pretty sure that most of you have been to an airport. And depending on where you're coming from, where you're flying to, what kind of document, passport, ID you're holding, you were treated differently. And sometimes that could have caused some irritation. Why are the people with the passport in the line next to you treated differently? Why do they get a faster pass? Why do I need to wait just because I'm from a different region or my document holds different value? So imagine when the airport becomes something as serious as your bank, as the people, as the organization that you decide to trust with your finances, the fruits of your labor, the inheritance you might have received from your parents, generally quite important stuff and pretty necessary for you to survive. So imagine that someone is trying to actually change that. So joining us today, there's Asya from First Boulevard. Hi, Asya. Hi there. Good morning. So I think we owe an uh, explanation or an expansion onto that metaphor to avoid any confusion, because I just mentioned that the airport becomes the place where finances are handled. But First Boulevard is a place that makes sure that finances are handled unlike they are in other places for Black America. So I think it would be great if instead of me babbling on, you would give us a elevator pitch, a summary of what First Boulevard is, what it does and who it does it for. Happy to. Yeah, so First Boulevard is a digitally native neobank. Our focus is on Black America. Having said that, we are all inclusive. So anybody is welcome to join. Allies are 100% welcome, and, and we really want you all to be part of this movement. Um, really, what we're looking at is a way to level the playing field and to essentially create a new system. You know, the current system when it comes to the financial services industry was created by a very narrow demographic of individuals. Let's call it as it is, middle-aged and older white men. And so we know that the benefits that, you know, that you mostly gather out of the financial industry sector comes, you know, for their benefit. So they're the ones that really enjoy it. They built the system to, to profit themselves. Um, and they didn't really take into consideration all the different unique challenges um, that black people face. And so that's really where we take a, take a bit of a stance and say, okay, we're going to build a different system, a system that is built by us, for us. Um, and we're, we're pretty confident that what we're building is actually going to have very far reaching effects in terms of, I don't think it's going to be something that's only positive for Black America. Oh, 100 percent, 100 percent. I want to I want to pull your finger more on that later when we'll be talking about the multidimensional, hopefully, nature of First Boulevard, because I'm pretty sure you're not just going to stop at doing a neobank. There's probably so much more to be done there. So for how long have you been doing this? Because if, if I'm not mistaken, the launch is set for later this year. But how much of gearing up, how much of preparation of legwork did it take? Gosh, you know, it's been a whirlwind. Um, so Donald and I, Donald is my co-founder. He's the CEO of the company and I'm the COO. Um, we, we're, we're good friends. And so we've known each other for several years already. Um, the two of us actually got sort of, you know, in touch again after what was happening last summer. Uh, and particularly it was the murder of George Floyd. So when the murder of George Floyd happened, I recall watching it on TV and thinking, how is this possible? You know, how is it that a human life is being compared to $20, right? Because essentially that's what we were talking about, a bum check or potentially a counterfeit, you know, $20 bill. For that amount of money, the cops were called and they killed a person. Other instances are, are like that in the community as well. Someone selling cigarettes, right, um, in the park, or even just nothing to do with their, their money in their hands, but just, you know, Skittles in your pocket, for example, a cell phone in your hand, a sandwich in your hand. And all of these things suddenly become a reason to kill you. And so what happened when George Floyd was there was he, you know, he was calling out to his mother. And I recall when he called out to his mama, my heart just sort of jumped. And I thought, what am I doing? I can't keep doing what I'm doing right now. And I need to just stop and I need to find a solution to this because lives are at stake. 
And I recall at that time reaching out to Donald and saying, Donald, you know, how are you doing and how are you processing this? Because I need help processing this. And he came out and he said, you know what? I think we need to solve this. You know, every single time we see these things, it call it all comes down to money. It all comes down to the fact that people are out there trying to get money and being constantly pushed down. Um, and I wrote an article earlier this year about how, you know, the system is entirely broken. It doesn't serve black communities at all. You know, and so we we at that point, that was May 25th. The following months, we sort of started thinking a little bit more about the idea, how we would formulate it. In August, we got incorporated. And then in the end of November, we raised our seed round. So we were really lucky. Donald and I honestly thought we were going to have to bootstrap this thing. Um, and we were fully you know, willing and prepared to do this. We both are serial entrepreneurs. We've done well in the fintech space. We know the space very well. We're comfortable in it. And we thought, we'll just do it. We'll just build it. Um, but we were lucky in that we found some amazing capital partners that were very mission aligned with us and it felt right. It felt right to kind of work with them. Um, and then we just put our heads down, started building. And now the goal is to launch in Juneteenth. So that's actually next month. Um, so to be able to go from incorporation in August to all the way to actually launching a product in June within like the first year, it's completely unheard of. Uh, but that's what we're slated to do right now. Definitely a good problem to have, right? So congrats on the on the momentum. And, uh, and, and exactly what you were saying just a moment ago about the perhaps not root cause, because I'm sure that there is some miseducation, xenophobia, and so on and so on going on in the minds of the people who are the causal place of, of racism. But when you look at the, uh, the the correlation, the causal correlation, just like you said, it, it is money. And it's not even to do with your current state mm -hmm. of finances. But we're, we're not just looking at the fact that, okay, you have a bruise and we need to slap a Band-Aid on it. We need to right. heal it. And exactly it is pretty much always the case of not having equal access because we don't want an equal finish line. We want an equal starting line. And the more those uh, situations or those contexts are not being aligned with what everybody's privy to, then no matter how good of a institution you set up or how friendly to this or that minority or ethnicity you become, you are still slapping band-aids on a problem that needs to be healed so how many people on your wait list are there right now let's let's flex a little just since your pre-launch yeah there are about almost two hundred thousand people on the wait list so far so it's it's grown pretty pretty darn quickly um the last few months i think word got out that we were building this a little bit more and suddenly we started seeing a lot more um a lot more pickup and traffic on our website um, and so we're we're really seeing people, though, um, Philippe, from all walks of life. You know, people often think that, oh, you're dealing with Black America, you're dealing with underbanked people, underserved people, they must be poor. And that's not the case. And that's something that I, you know, I always want to emphasize is that dealing with and sort of building a product for unbanked and underbanked people is not synonymous with saying that we're building a bank for poor people. What we're doing is building a bank that, you know, equalizes the playing field. So like you said, has an equal starting point. And I'll give you a direct example of, I think, believe it was last summer or just actually just a couple of months ago as well. Jimmy Kennedy, an ex-NFL football player, right? Multimillionaire. The guy has earned, what, $13 million over the course of his career, retired, went to J.P. Morgan Chase and said, hey, I want to open up a private client account. So for those of you that don't know, to open up a private client account, all that it requires is putting $150,000 in the bank. He went ahead and put in almost a million dollars into their bank. He gets assigned an account manager and guess what? They assigned him the only other black employee <laughs> at that branch because, hey. I have a friend, I have a friend right, who's that's black. It. That's exactly Look, the same. You got a black employee, there you go, right? And so, so they assigned him the black employee, which was a good thing, you know, actually because they were able to speak freely. And so what ended up happening was, you know, he kept on checking on his private client status and saying, hey, where's my private client status? When are you gonna be able to upgrade my account to private client? And during one of these calls, which luckily Jimmy Kennedy was able to record, his account manager told him, 
hey, I'm really sorry, but my superiors, you know, white men, they don't feel comfortable giving you that status. They're worried because what if you get angry at them and you're this big black man? Can you imagine being told that? That as a multimillionaire, his money was not good enough for JP Morgan Chase. And we're talking about a major brand bank. We're not talking about some sort of obscure private bank run by a couple of you know brothers or something. No, this is an actual you know federal institution. And, and they're, ab they're able to do this form of discrimination. And that's like on a, on, a, on a more sort of high level case. And luckily in this case, you know, Jimmy Kennedy has the clout, the, the public persona to be able to go out and say this and gather attention for it. But there are numerous other black people that if they go to their teller at their bank branch, and you'll see these sort of incidents pop up on Twitter, for example. And I recall there was this producer, again, just a couple of months ago, who tweeted about this. He's actually a friend of a friend. Um, and he mentioned, he was like, yeah, I was just at the bank teller. I was trying to withdraw some money and the teller refused. And then the teller said that they felt threatened and that they were going to call the cops on him. Having the cops called on you just for trying to withdraw your own money. That's what's happening. Especially so bearing in mind, especially bearing in mind how that is pretty much at least statistically a little bit of a sentence when the police gets called on you as a as a minority. And it, it needs to be emphasized that, of course, right now we are talking about uh extremely outlier example because I'm pretty sure that First Boulevard isn't aimed at ex NFL multimillionaires who bank in JP Morgan and record their phone calls. And quite quite ironically, the the one thing that the bank did correct in that situation was just like you said, assigning uh also a person of color so they could speak freely. And I'm pretty sure that they didn't do it on purpose. They just did it out of assumption. And also what, what begs the huge question mark here, especially in a company that deals with finances, with, with margins, with profitability, is at what point do you not, or at what point do you oversee your limitations to the tune where it hinders your ability to make money? Because as a private banking client, your fees are higher and there is an expected turnover, there's an expected amount of assets. So that's also what, what, what gets me personally is at what point do you not see that, let's even put emotions aside or like yeah. you are in the business of making money, how are you failing to make money for such a stupid reason? Yep, I mean, it hurts the economy, it hurts America. It really hurts America to have 13% of your population not involved in your economy in the way that it really could be. That's 13% of this country that is being pushed down and not being able to reach its true potential, you know, simply because it's being barred, you know, entry into basic financial services. Yeah, yeah. And and just like I said, this is the story that we heard because it's someone who has the reach, who had the mental fortitude to react in a situation of, okay, I'll record this, I will have proof. So what can we say to our dear audience? Survivorship bias. How many people did not get their voice heard or their story told? That's we it. don't know, but let's make sure that with First Boulevard, that's at least going to be hindered. So if we were to talk a little bit about who is the typical customer persona, because as we've established, this story is a story of an outlier. But in terms of the, the, the majority, have you been able to group them somehow or put them in yeah, stages? Sure. So, so this is, you know, we did a lot of customer discovery, learned a lot about our customers by speaking with them, interviewing them, um, surveys, you know, as, as, as I mentioned, we have this wait list of 200,000 people. And so we were able to kind of pull from them to kind of understand what they wanted us to build, you know, and that's the key point here is that, you know, our audience, our, our target market is very sophisticated. They know what they want and they know what they need. They just haven't had access to it. And so what we've been doing is polling them. Um, now we've given her a name based on what we're seeing. Um, she's Nia. She's in her mid thirties. She's a highly educated black woman. Um, she actually has a master's degree, probably even a PhD degree. 
Uh, we're taught, you know, as black and brown people in our communities that you have to get educated in order to have access, in order to kind of get ahead. Um, and I don't know if you know, Philippe, but um, a college educated black person has the same earning potential as a white high school dropout in America. But they just have the student debt, right? Yeah. But I mean, that's that to me is crazy. A white high school dropout earns the same amount of money as a black like college graduate. And that's crazy. But anyway, so Nia went ahead and she got her education because she needs to do that just to even the playing field to that point to to a you know white high school grad, uh, dropout. And so she's she essentially is is somebody who is the financial head of her household um, and has that student debt, right? And, and and basically is having to pay that down. And so what we've done is is basically mapped out a financial journey for Nia and, and so that we can make sure that we're able to serve her from cradle to grave, right? So we're looking at her in terms of where is she within her financial journey. So Nia tends to be at that debtor stage, which is where we need to maybe help her sort of manage her student loans, consolidate them, maybe help her refinance them so that her payments are a little bit more manageable. Um, and if they're a little bit more manageable, she might have a few dollars left over to be able to put aside into a, a savings account. And then hopefully graduate her into that saver stage. In that saver stage, we're helping her to put aside an emergency fund, you know, five, six hundred dollars, put it aside. So that if anything ever happens to her, she's got a little bit of a cushion and she's not at zero dollars or negative. Um, the next stage after the saver stage is to get the, the, the individual, the user into an investor stage. So at the investor stage is where we start teaching Nia and our other secondary personas how to start making money from their money. And that's where we start teaching them about, you know, investing in, in different stocks and different ETFs, um, taking their roundups, for example, and just automatically investing them for, for our customers, um, as well as the crypto piece. So this is actually a really exciting piece as well, because the Black community traditionally has not been involved in the crypto space, even though one third, so 30% of Black Americans actually own some Bitcoin or some form of crypto, which is a really high number. It was really surprising to me. But again, if you look at the way the crypto exchanges are made and who has built them, you don't see that same level of representation in those companies either. So we're hoping again to change that. So we'll have our own crypto exchange as well for Black America. And then the final stage is the legacy builder. And so this is where we start teaching our customers how it is to kind of build an actual estate and start thinking about will and trust and start thinking about, you know, how do you take care of the future generations? And this is something that we know Nia is really concerned about and most of our general population is as well. Was there anything that surprised you about Nia, about the findings that you gathered from those 200,000 people? And I'm not specifically, because because we've heard those stories uh, that make our eyes pop in the sense of how could such unfairness and injustice appear in our everyday lives? But perhaps not in that regard, but was there something that surprised you that was completely unexpected? Not yet another story of mm -hmm. discrimination, hopefully, but something that was like, wow, never thought of that. You know, one, one of the things that um, actually stood out for me from one of the interviews was one of our, our interviewees, she mentioned how when she was in college and her roommate's grandparent passed away. And, and this is how she says it. She's like, my, my roommate's grandparent passed away. And, and when they passed away, my roommate was able to graduate debt free because she got an inheritance from her grandparent that passed on. She's like, when my grandmother passed away, though, I ended up having to open up a GoFundMe account to pay for her burial. And that was really sort of impactful for me because I realized that that's so true. These are one of those little things that you kind of take for granted, right? You always hear about a grandparent passing away and, oh, I got some inheritance. I went out and bought a car or something or, yeah, I put it into my education fund. But you know, there's a huge part of our country that just doesn't have that ever happen. Inheritance is not something that's very normal or like, it's not a common thing in the black and brown communities. 
And that to me was a little bit surprising because you kind of hear all the stories, right? Like most of these fairy tales are about that or like, oh, I want to know what my ancestors are going to leave me. And it's kind of in the end, there's like, there's nothing, right? Um, and, and that's been something that is like a perpetuated um, situation. And that's, that's, again, you know, goes back to the idea of the financial inequity, right? You can't, we're, we're told to buy houses, you know, go ahead and purchase real estate. And so, you know, that's a way to kind of gain wealth. But if you purchase a property and it's in a predominantly black neighborhood, your property values are far lower than if you had purchased in a white neighborhood, right? Um, your our, our homes appraise for a lower value. Um, so I don't know if you saw that article as well. It was the Austin family in California. Um, and they had they had their house appraised and the appraisal they got was really, really low. And so they they you know appealed the decision and basically went to their um their their fin their financer and said, hey, can you just we'd like to just get another appraiser to come in. Um, and so this time what they did is they got their neighbor, who is a white woman, to come in and pretend to be the owner of the house. And she came in with all of her family pictures. So they took down all of the black family pictures and she put up her white family pictures on the walls. And that very same house, Philippe, it ended up appraising for 50% higher. It was hundreds of thousands of dollars higher than when the appraiser thought that the owner was black. Just out of curiosity, do you know what happened? Were they like confronted with uh, this? You can read about it. You can Google it and see, because um, it actually just came out recently as well. So it's just crazy because I, you know, I, I love this time that we're in because I feel like this is the t this is the age of accountability. We're still not seeing justice, but we're at least seeing some sense of accountability where these news stories are, are actually reaching daylight. We're actually hearing about them. Whereas before these things were happening, but we would never hear about them. You True. Know, speaking. True. Especially on top of that, the layer uh, a little bit philosophically here, just like the story of Plato, whether we are moral because we are intrinsically moral or whether we are moral because we are being watched. And mm -hmm. as we are being shown footage from police cams, body cams actually, or hearing that it's gone missing or that it's been turned off. So actually... Yeah being aware of the fact that you can be held accountable and making sure that there's no material to actually hold you accountable to. So yeah. I, I completely agree. That's what I, even in terms of any discrimination, regardless what is the basis for that discrimination, that's also what I really enjoy about the internet that you don't get to get away with anything on the spot. And also for the future, it could actually, and, and even if we don't counteract the, unfair treatment of one person to another person at the level of their why, I think it's already a huge stepping stone if we can counteract the fact if they do it at all. Because right now, knowing that there are so many cameras, anybody can whip up a mobile phone, live stream it, and you just cannot take it off the internet. Yep. That, I think that helps a lot with just making sure that people think twice before. Is this something that I would be ashamed of? Will my granny call me and tell me, you know, I'm ousted from the family? Yeah, I'll, I'll just stop. I won't do that. <laughs> so we've spoken about the four stages. We've so, spoken about the fact that you left your day jobs, um, about the challenges that Black Americans face financially, uh, about the investors. And I'm, I'm just curious to close up that topic on leaving the job and, and the investors. You mentioned that it was... Uh, emotional response, emotional response that led you to a rational choice that, you know, if I'm being true to myself, I just got to do it. Mm -hmm. But as far as I know, your day job was a pretty good job at a, at a tech company. So was that a difficult choice to just say? Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's a very huge shift in your career. Um, so, you know, so just for some context professionally, you know, I, I actually started my career in, um, in tech at Cisco Systems in Amsterdam. So that was in the Europe, Middle East and Africa headquarters. 
Um, when I joined that company, there were only a couple hundred of us. By the time I left, there were 5,000. It, it kind of grew really, really quickly. Um, we, we didn't have those buildings. So actually we were in the middle of constructing the, the EMEA headquarters in Zaudost in Amsterdam. Um, so it was a pretty exciting time, but I felt like I needed to kind of do something a little bit more meaningful even then. Um, so I did some work with Amnesty International, some documentary production stuff, and um, actually was part of a, a small crew that went out to um, to Pakistan to film a documentary on honor killings. Um, and it, it was pretty exciting to do as well. Um, then worked on some you know, women's emancipation documentary work as well for some NGOs. And then I realized I wanted to sort of see more of the world. And so moved over to Africa, to Egypt in the Middle East, um, spent some time there and you know owned my own business there as well. So that was a marketing and PR communications firm. Um, we became the sole affiliate for Burson Marsteller. So that was a, a really cool place, you know, really cool place to be in because we launched a lot of like commercial products. So we worked with Starbucks, you know, launching Starbucks in Egypt, um, as well as H&M and L'Oreal. But then conversely, also worked with a bunch of UN agencies. So eradicated polio in Egypt, which was really exciting. Like how many people can say they got to eradicate polio? Um, you know, working on other public health campaigns as well as UNIFEM and UN AIDS campaigns. Uh, and then the revolution started. And so that that essentially brought me to, to Chicago, where again, as a Canadian citizen, you can't just start earning an income. You can pay taxes, but you can't get a job. And so I became an investor. And so I came here on an investor visa um, and opened up another company. And this time it was Shala Plus, which was a medical spa wellness center. Um, we had doctors, we had um, psychologists, dentists, um, as well as like a whole fitness facility. That was great in the Chicago suburbs. And then I realized I missed tech because I really wanted to do something that had more of an exponential impact. Um, and again, an impact for, for good. Um, overall and societally speaking. Um, and so moved to San Francisco Bay Area, was part of the founding team at Synapse Financial Technologies, which was one of the original banking as a service um, platforms. And through them got to launch hundreds of different fintech platforms. A lot of the household names that you hear of now, um, companies like Dave, Abra, Kraken. Um, so even like crypto platforms, so that was pretty cool. And then um, spent some time in the KYC space at SoCure. Uh, I was always curious about KYC because I still fail KYC to this day. <laughs> I, there's a, there are new banks that won't be able to bank me. So, and I've tried recently. I tried like last year, I think, to get an account at Vero Money, um, and I was rejected because Vero Money couldn't see me. Um, and so things like that, like that, I was like, oh, I got to figure this out. Like, I need to crack this nut. Um, and then uh, at the time, I was actually um, senior vice president of revenue at Scylla Money, which was um, Shamir Karkel's newest company. He's the original one of the co-founders of Simple, which is the original neobank ever. And so was spending time you know, at that company, really enjoying myself. Um, great company, great team. But then when this happened, I really didn't think I had a choice. Quite honestly, Philippe, I didn't think there was a choice for me. Um, and it was one of those things where, you know, again, lucky to be in the position that I'm in to be able to say, all right, I won't have an income potentially, but, you know, I've got three sons at home and I want to see them safe. You know, I want to see Donald safe. You know, and Donald has two kids as well. I want to see his children are safe. And to me, that was more important than worrying about where my next paycheck would come from. This is uh, such a profound interview that sometimes I just don't want to give you a commonplace response because I don't want to disrespect it with saying something like, yeah, or you're right. <laughs> I can only say that when you're talking about the KYC part, I recall the only time as a obviously white male educated working in IT, so pretty much hitting the bullseye of, of winning the lottery. Uh, when I moved to the UK and I was homeless for three days and because of not having a place to provide as an address and just having my Polish passport, I wasn't able to enter the banking system in the UK. And this makes me realize how grateful I am because that was the only time where that was 
just an inconvenience at best. But yeah. I knew that, you know, once I get the address, it will be all all sorted out. So, yeah. you know, profound conclusions here. And we're just midway, basically, in the interview. So in terms of what I mentioned about the financial logic or lack thereof in some racist choices or behaviors from organizations, I'm getting the feeling that your investors worked conversely that they were ex like when we mentioned JP Morgan and they were extremely not smart, then your investors must be extremely smart because you are tapping into a space that I, I don't think you have much competition. Mm -mm. So there's not like 20 yeah. or even 10 or even five organizations yeah. like yours. No, that's true. And I, and, and we really lucked out. Um, so on, on the Anthemist side, so Anthemist is one of our, our investors as well as P72 and, you know, shout out to both of their teams because they're incredible. Um, but Anthemist on the Anthemist side, I'm actually part of their female innovators lab. And so they invested in us through that, um, through that lab. Uh, and basically, you know, we've got this team like Katie who's there. Um, Jillian actually was the one that, you know, we kind of first connected with. Um, but Jillian, Katie and Tom, they've just been incredible. You know, they have this structure in place that is there to not just give you dumb money, but to actually help you support you, you know, so that you're growing as an organization. Um, so it's a very long term sort of hand in hand partnership. Same thing with P72, um, our partners there, you know, Trip, Adam. And Dave, they, they, you know, and Travis, they actually work with us and, and sort of help us see around corners. They're helping us design out the product, you know, so they've got all these experts on staff that are able to kind of be like they're on your team and they're helping to inform your product roadmap. They're helping you with your financials. So all of these things that otherwise we would need to hire all these separate people to do all these things. We've got these incredible industry leading experts available to us anytime we ask for it so it's it's really amazing because like it wasn't just the money you know because like there's a lot of money out there in terms of the different investors but you got to find that th those investors that you know are about this mission and these were the folks that just got it from day one so when Donald and i you know first pitched them they they understood it didn't take a lot of like wrestling to kind of get them to understand what we were building they were just like, yeah, this is absolutely needed. And yes, you two are the right ones to actually build this. Um, so it's it's been amazing. And, and I can't wait, you know, to keep working with them, you know, over the next rounds as well. There's a there's a follow up question. But just before that, I want to take a second and dear audience, uh, there's a question right now that we're going to take, but please, by all means, and also blue, because I know that you're watching. Uh, also, make sure to pop in a comment. Uh, this comment comes from Tomas, and Tomas is asking, what was the most encouraging and discouraging, if there was one that was discouraging, because from what you're saying, it seems like it's a story full of roses, but perhaps there was something discouraging that you heard yeah. from the investors. Well, you know, I, I don't want it to sound like we got out there and just all this money was available to us um, and, and that it wasn't hard work. So, you know, Donald and I, we we pitched to a lot of different firms and, you know, we got a lot of no's. So ultimately, though, we were able to raise an oversubscribed A round. So our A round was oversubscribed and then we were able to pick the ones we liked. So I guess the, the most discouraging things would be things like, you um, no, definitely is discouraging. But you know, Donald and I, we, we say we eat no's for breakfast. We're both in the revenue space. We sell. And so for us, it's like someone says no, it's like, huh, did you say yes maybe later? Like, <laughs> <laughs> did you say yes, like talk to us in a couple of weeks? That kind of, is that what you just said? Um, so we don't really, it doesn't phase us. Uh, and I think Donald and I are pretty positive when it comes to business in general. Um, but you know, one of the things that was a little bit dis d discouraging was like, well, but is this market really important enough for you to really tackle, you know, things like that, where where folks wouldn't say it flat out that way, but it comes across as like, but is this really a worthwhile demographic? You know, and it's like, yeah, we're, we're from that community. So we think it's pretty worthwhile. And we do think 13% of the American population is very worthwhile. In terms of encouraging, um, just there were so many encouraging things, you know, essentially when you're part of a call and you see people that look like you 
on that call. And this was something that was really kind of incredible because in previous companies that I've been part of, you know, we've raised multi-million dollar raises, right? Uh, multi-million dollar rounds. And the people that were on those calls didn't look like me and Donald. But now we're starting to see that. We see women, we see black people, we see brown people. It's the faces changing, at least those the folks that were interested in us were those people that kind of came to us and put money into us. Um, and even if they didn't look like us, they actually got it. And so I, I remember with P72, you know, and, and sort of having them say, this is a no brainer, guys, we're in, let's just figure this out. And they were the leads of our round. So I think, you know, that to me is really encouraging that even when someone is not from our demographic, not from our community necessarily, but they themselves can jump in and be like, yeah, I get it. And I'm going to support you. And to show true allyship, right? And not just performative actions, but actual allyship where they, they literally put their money where their mouth was and said, we're going to back you guys. So that to us was very encouraging. But Tomas, like we got so many no's and we will get so many more no's. Um, but, you know, it's just part of, it's part of the deal. Mm, yeah, uh, I wanted to ask whether the the no's that you got, apart from the ones that you mentioned, uh, that were like uh, like throwing shade, but like a backhanded compliment mm -hmm. or something like that, uh, did you often hear COVID as a? And let's not even discuss uh, mm -hmm. whether that was a genuine response or a, faci a facetious one. Uh, did you hear? COVID as a, no, we're not investing right now because it's a difficult time to evaluate risk, yada, yada. Yeah, you know, we didn't hear about COVID, um, but I think it also had to do with when we were raising. So, you know, when we when we were raising, it was the second half of the year. Um, and so the pandemic had already been kind of like full force. You know, it started in March. And so by the time, you know, July, August hit, actually we started having these investor calls in like September. So by that time, we were already kind of into it. And I think a lot of the VCs sort of understood that they needed to make a decision, you know, to be active investors or not. Um, and so most of the folks that we spoke with had already decided to be active. So, so we didn't hear that too much. What we did hear was you're early, right? Which is normal. You hear that often. You're kind of early stage. And then you're like, well, that other portfolio company that you gave $30 million to and still hasn't delivered a product is out there. So, you know, early is code um, for, you know, we're not ready to commit to you and that's fine. Um, but yeah, I think uh, I think it's it's basically you you find the match, you know, and you make sure that the mission alignment is there. And, and you kind of really have to think about this carefully because you're going to be working with these partners for the rest of your company's lifetime. So these are really important decisions. And I think, you know, if you get a no, you, you need to just walk away and be okay with that. Whatever well, the reason is, right? Investors, private equity, hedges, you heard it here first. If you don't muster up some empathy to get it, you're leaving money at the table. So, you know, be, be, be smart about it or smarter <laughs> about it. So um, I wanted to talk about um, the competition aspect or perhaps let me redefine it. As any company, you will want to build a moat around your business model to make sure that nobody who has a similar infrastructure in the similar space just says, okay, let's flip this, this, and that switch. And now we have also the same functionalities in here. So if you could answer this twofold, because one thing is how do you protect yourself from the biggest and baddest ones who are there and will try to do some, perhaps just like you said, performative action, but still that will replicate your business model. And on the other hand, players that are not from the banks that have been for God knows how long around here, just trying to adapt, but the ones who would say, hey, maybe we can do First Boulevard better or in a different region or anything, right? Yeah, no, for sure. And, and, you know, so shout out to the Greenwood team. Um, they're another team out there that is building a black and brown bank. Um, so they, they have expanded their mandate a little bit. So it's not just the black community like ours is. Um, but, you know, absolutely love what they're doing. They've got a stellar team. Um, and I think what I'm what excites me about that is is that 
again, you know, I keep saying 13% of the population of America is black. Just one bank or two banks isn't going to be enough to serve us all. So I, I welcome other banks and other new banks to kind of come out here and build services for this community. It's needed. So that's number one. So I actually, you know, I always say there are thousands of white banks in America already. You know, if, if we have a hundred black banks, I think we're gonna be great. You know, we'll, we'll do just fine. Um, the other thing though, is where I do feel like we do need to protect our community from is the performative allyship, right? Where, where you have, for example, a neobank that has actually been serving our customers badly, right? But serving our customers, and then they realize, oh gosh, well, George Floyd ho happened, so let's put a black square on our social media. And oh gosh, hey, we want to be banking for everybody, so so let's get you know a a basketball player, you know, on our round, or or let's bring in a rapper and have him shoot some commercials. And it's like, you know what? Did you, did you ever get to talk to the Nias that are using your product? because Nia doesn't care about that basketball player or that rapper that you got. And the fact that that's what you think is going to appeal to your audience just clearly shows that you still don't get it, right? And these, these platforms are still, and I always say, the majority of their customers are Nia's because Nia's are not getting served in the incumbent banks. So they're going to the Neo banks. They're very digitally native. They want the service, right? Um, and by the way, when we do our, our, our surveys and we ask them, what would you need to be able to switch from your current neobank? They're like, nothing, just build it. We will be there because we're not getting what we need from Chime or from Vero Money or from Chase or from Bank of America. They're not getting it. All they're getting is this performative sort of action and that's not working. The other thing is, is that what we really focus on at First Boulevard is making sure that we're hiring the best people for our team, the top people, right? Regardless of their skin color. And because we've done that, you know, our team, it's crazy because like our team is 85% black, indigenous, or people of color. Our leadership team is 100% BIPOC. And we didn't have to go through any crazy like amounts of contortion to reach this level of diversity. All we did was put out job descriptions and said we wanted the best for this job. And regardless of skin color, you know, race, religion, zip code, we went ahead and hired the best people. And surprise, surprise, you know, our company is very diverse. So I often say like, you know, actually Donald often says, that our IP is our diversity and the fact that we're so anti-racist. And we hope that other banks will follow suit. We don't think they can though, because that would take a lot of systemic dismantling for that to happen. You know, when, when someone like the CEO of Wells Fargo can come out and say it's a pipeline problem and that's why he doesn't have more black people in his company, you know, shame on him, shame on the industry to not have the right representation within their organizations. And shame on the new banks coming out saying, let's put a black man, you know, basketball player or a rapper on TV, and that should show that we care about black people. Yeah, it's a, it's a eco chamber of tone deafness, just like the meme with Steve Buscemi of how do you do fellow kids essentially, well, you know, let's, <laughs> yeah. let's, put a, let's put an NBA player there, then we relate, then it's just, ticked off right yeah. um and especially i'm getting the sense that you are the type of person that even if there arose all of a sudden a thousand banks like yours trying to compete if there is so much competition meaning that there is so much need and demand i don't think that you would prefer to be the one and only bank mm -mm. as opposed to actually solving what you're trying to solve that's it we, you know, uh, just us alone, we won't be able to solve it all. So we need everyone to smarten up. We need everyone to take on this mantle and, and join, you know, to kind of solve this problem. And honestly, it's, it's good for America if we do, right? 
it's really good for America if we do this, if we solve this. So on to solving. Two questions from the audience. Uh, as expected and asked, Blue joins me. <laughs> Blue actually lives in Warsaw. So I want to frame this question. In what ways can we begin to educate the community about finances? And Asya, I don't want to let you go off easy. I don't want to hear about what can be done if you're living in the States. Uh, Blue is actually originally from Texas, if I oh, cool. recall correctly. And sure, you're in the States. There's a lot of focus. There's a lot of issues that create the focus, but also there is the focus. Mm -hmm. uh, in Poland, as much there is little discrimination in the violent form that we see reported from the states there is still a lot of uh it's not even in the level of active hate it's more in the level of uh you know being eyeballed in the street as not mm -hmm. something that you want to actively discriminate but something that you're like looking what, what's going on like i'm just not familiar with this yeah. so when you take it to a land that isn't even at the level of this being a problem, but rather being so estranged with people looking different or coming from different backgrounds. How can Blue begin to educate the community about finances? He doesn't have First Boulevard in Poland, not yeah. yet, fingers crossed. Mm -hmm. But uh, what do you say to someone who is in such a faraway country, say Poland, yeah. Italy, whatever would it be, still so, the States? Yeah, so I, I would say, so First Boulevard, we have two main products. Um, one of them is the PFM tool. And so the PFM tool does not require you to open up a bank account. So essentially anyone can open that okay. and start learning about finances. So we thought about this because what we didn't want was for people to, you know, feel that that this huge hurdle of, oh, I got to open up an account. I got to switch everything over in order to take advantage of what we're offering. And so we're like, no, we want you to learn. And so one of the key things, though, for us is that we don't look at it as financial literacy. You know, we look at it as financial education. So I really appreciate Blue for kind of phrasing his question in this way. Um, but, you know, that, that's kind of really important is that it's financial education um, and it's just in time financial education that we provide. So what we do is when you do, you know, become a PFM user, we're able to kind of try to understand a little bit more about what it is that you're trying to achieve. And based on that, um, we've actually created a bunch of uh, content in the form of tracks, audio tracks, um, versus things that you have to read. And so they're like consumable content. So quick one minute, two minute recordings that we actually upload into your personal playlist based on what is going to be important to you. So again, Let's say we see that Blue is, you know, going out there um, and they're and they're clicking on like house buying, right? You know, they're reading articles about buying a house. Then at that point, what we would do is say, oh, hey, Blue, we see that you're looking at some house stuff. Why don't you listen to this track all about saving up for a mortgage, right? Saving up for your down payment. And then why don't you, you know, read the, or listen to this track that talks about, um, you know, interest rates, et cetera. And so that gets pushed into Blue's account so that Blue can listen to it whenever they feel like listening to it. Um, and then what we do is you have these little quizzes at the, at the end and that actually enables you to earn points and money. Um, so as you're completing these courses, you're incentivized to learn more. Um, and then we have products that are partnered with each of those modules to help you just automatically take action on the things that you've learned. So we've really kind of put it in a, in a very sort of enmeshed way. Um, and we're lucky because we've got Dr. Melody um, Wright on our team. And she actually is, is our financial sort of coach that basically works on all this content. But she is our director of financial education. She's also on Instagram as um, Live Broke on Purpose, which is really, really cool. Yeah. Loving the handle. Um... Yeah, so Blue, I, I hope that uh, that answers your question. But just out of personal curiosity, those tips and pointers, they're contextual. As I progress through the app, I go on the crypto exchange and the app recognizes my first time in this area of the app. So it's going to try to educate me. But when you say playlist, you mean that there's something within the app or is that yeah. sending me out of the app to like? It's it's in your so it's actually in your in your app. It's a very like Spotify type of experience. 
Um, so you'll have a playlist that is for you. Um, and then it has like all these tracks that basically get uploaded into your personal playlist, as well as some more, you know, general sort of playlists. So think of them like albums. So you can listen to the house buying album, you can listen to the student loan refinancing album, um, and they'll have little tracks in, in them to kind of explain and break down everything um, in easy to understand ways. But again, what we didn't want to do was just sort of throw all that content up there and then nobody looks at it. We wanted to basically push it to you based on your activity, based on your goals, right? Based on what you tell us you're trying to do. Um, and then we also just analyze. So for those customers that do have accounts connected. Um, so this is the other thing. There are many different ways. So number one is like, just use the financial education. Number two is connect your external bank accounts and we can analyze your transactions and give advice based on that. And then the other, like the final stage is just to open up a first Boulevard account as well. And then we'll be able to kind of take all that information from all three areas and, and be able to better advise you in terms of what it is that you're looking for. Okay. That's, uh, that's interesting. And blue confirms that it does answer wonderfully his question. So awesome. glad, glad we did that. Now back to, uh, back to Tomas in terms of solutions. What is the solution to you saying to Donald in a year or two from now, we made it, or perhaps not made it by it, meaning all of a sudden America is no longer racist, not a single discriminatory person in sight, but rather we've made a change. This is perhaps one of a hundred steps, but we've done two. Yeah. You know, I think for us, um, we would love to see, you know, more active users on the platform. Um, I'd love to see the number of um, black owned banks to increase. So right now, um, black owned banks, I think when we when Don and I first started this, there were 19 of them. At this point, I believe there are only 14. So and, and that's just in this short period of time, like less than a year. Um, we're losing a lot of black owned banks. Um, MDIs are going down. So minority depository institutions are going down as well. And our goal really is like, again, remember, we are not a bank ourselves. So we are that technology layer and we have sponsor banks on the back end. Um, we would love to partner with more MDIs and more black owned banks to be able to send deposits out. So, you know, one of the ways that we would see success, Tomas, is to see that, you know, the number of banks that are flourishing on our back end to increase, you know, and so for them to not be shutting down at the rate that they're shutting down right now. Um, so we would love to see more MDIs come out. Um, we would love to see more customers be active, right, and, and move from that debtor saver to the investor stage. So I would love to see, you know, a strong proportion of our customers to already be moved into that investor and the legacy builder stage. And then another statistic that Donald and I are tracking very closely, um, and I don't know if you've heard this, but by the year 2053, the median income of the black family is going to drop to zero. Same. So Right? No, it's crazy, isn't it? So there's there's the Road to Zero Wealth, which is published by Prosperity Now and the Institute for Policy Studies. And they basically did a study in terms of like, where is the black median income trending? And it is trending downward. So essentially what you're gonna see is that the debt is increasing, right? Versus the income that they're able to make. And so, but to see that it's trending to zero is is really disastrous. And so what we're trying to do is see if we can reverse that by teaching folks, you know, better financial hygiene habits um, in terms of being able to move from that debtor stage into the saver stage, into the investor stage and the legacy builder. Um, but we would love to sort of see that start reversing itself because like 2053 is not too far off. No, it's not. No, it's not. Absolutely no. And uh perhaps a, a, a weird segue or transition or reversal to actually what you mentioned about crypto. Uh, I, I really like the fact that you're, you're doing this with, with Visa being your partner, correct? Yeah. Because uh, of course, many cryptos are based on the assumption of blockchain, mm -hmm. but of course, those some of those assumptions go out the window when you start using not your wallet, but actually yeah. an exchange you lose, the anonymity you lose, everything yeah. really. Um, but the opportunity of logarithmic growth all of a sudden, like you've seen with Dogecoin or any other altcoin that's just there 
for the purpose of existing. Uh, I think that's, that's, that's really great because uh, as much as all of the other things can be said against you because First Boulevard potentially could not dive deep into the level of uh, this user is not being treated fairly in their place of employment. We cannot counteract the fact that they haven't been given a raise or a promotion because of their skin color. Wow. However, here, crypto doesn't really care. Crypto can skyrocket and the same hundred dollars that you put in on a coin that was worth one cent yesterday mm -hmm. could be put into 50 cents tomorrow. And all of those hurdles are removed. So uh, we actually had the head of innovation of Visa. Uh, I'm not sure if for the same region as you operate in, but uh, it's really good to see that the, the stories are, are moving moving that way. Yeah. Thomas is saying in the comments that he's keeping his fingers crossed not to see the forecast of 2053 come yeah. to life, not only within the black community. And also, that's what I want to ask you. Is the only roadblock to expanding to another country, outside of obviously the effort, the manpower, the, the roadmap plans, having a partner bank that provides you with the license to the local activities? Is that like the I'm sure there are smaller things, but is that yeah. like the major hurdle? That that usually is, you know. So if you're, um, you know, you need to have someone that is locally licensed um, and also locally insured, right? Because in the USA, you have the FDIC, um, and so you want to make sure that whatever you're doing with your your customers' money is safe. Um, and there there are ways to do it. So you know, luckily, um, Anthemis is one of our investors, and their LP is Barclays. So Barclays is on our cap table. So, you know, you might see us out in London sometime soon. Um, but then, you know, same thing with finding a bank in Canada or finding a bank in South America. But it, it really just um, the way that I see it, I think international is, is somewhere um, for us to head out to because I think the diaspora needs to be served. Um, and I think unity in the diaspora is something that's, you know, sorely needed. Um, so I think there's been a lot of sort of you know, this sort of bifurcating of the diaspora and sort of is it the the black immigrant community or is it the the black American community, et cetera? Um, are they African? Are they, you know, Southern um, from the islands or are they from Canada? So I think what we need to see is a little bit more unity on that front as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that the the sort of connecting the diaspora is something that's definitely on our roadmap as well. Good to hear, and we are happy to help to connect with any local partners or anybody that we that, that we might know. Awesome. We are hitting the fifty eighth minute mark, and before <laughs> I get some notes from the studio telling me to shut up already, I would like to wrap it up with two questions. Two questions that we always ask to our guests. Um, number one is, what is your decision making framework? And just to give you an example, it can be very specific, can be extremely broad. My generic decision-making framework is, is this good? And second question, is this good for me? Cake, mm -hmm. surely good. Is it good for me? <laughs> Perhaps not. So, you know, give me something like that, either personal or private, what helps you make a decision, whether yes or a no or a maybe? Yeah, so I think for us, our North Star is, um, you know, is it good for our community? You know, really, that's kind of what we look at first. Um, is, is this going to be good for Black America? Um, is this going to be good for America? And then is this good for the company? You know, so we look at it from all those, you know, three sort of points. Um, and then, you know, obviously when we say is it good for the community, our employees are very top of mind because our, our employees are very representative of our community as well. So we really try to think about that. Um, but we always, we, you know, one of the mottos we have is um, whole human. So we, we are and operate as a whole human organization um, where we really look at everyone as a full individual, not just a human resource or not just like a VP of engineering or a VP of product, but as, as an individual with a life, with feelings, with, um, with family members and loved ones. Um, and so that when you, when you operate from that perspective, it's really hard then to do evil, at least for us. Um, and, and, you know, what we want to do is really avoid that piece. Solid, solid answer. And now the, the next question concerns a magic wand, which I am virtually handing over to you. And with that magic wand, you get to abracadabra into anything that will cause all of the 12-year-olds on the planet to learn something. A skill, a concept, whatever it is. Not hinting at first Boulevard Junior, right? Wink, right. wink, of course. But 
in all seriousness, we've heard things like financial prudence, emotional intelligence, coding, whatever it is, you can repeat those. Just, just make it yours. I want to hear yeah. what would it be. Yeah, I mean, this is going to sound so corny and cheesy and probably not what other people say. But for me, it really is just love and empathy, you know, um, connect with your heart again, you know, be be true to who you are as an individual um, and, and learn, honestly, to, to love yourself, because I find like a lot of the stuff that we're seeing out there is is from a lot of hurt people. You know, people are carrying so much trauma in their lives, um, trauma that they've inherited you know, from previous generations. Um, there's a book that I absolutely love by Rishma Menachem. Um, it's called My Grandmother's Hands. And, and I highly recommend everyone read it. Um, but the way that, you know, that they, they kind of break down um, the effect of intergenerational trauma on the individual and how it manifests in our societies. Um, and I think, you know, it all comes down to being able to love yourself, being able to give yourself the freedom to be right um, so that you're not lashing out in negative ways. So you're not out there, you know, digging your knee in the back of someone's neck and thinking that that's OK, thinking that you're somehow justified in doing that because you had it rough. You know, thinking you can go and shoot a bunch of Asian women because, you know, you're tempted by them. So these are the kind of things, if you look at the, the soul root of all of it, it's, it's people that are so disconnected with their own empathy and their own hearts that that, that would be my, my magic wand wave. I think that's true. I mean, you, you couldn't possibly convince someone who is loved and loves themselves and is educated to entertain the concept of racism right like if you take someone who has their head on straight has gone through some education and has a degree of self-awareness understanding where they fell short but also what they can love themselves for there's no way yep. you could convince someone into that exactly. so completely agree there with you and actually i want to wrap it up without any haughty conclusions but just <laughs> highlighting a comment also from blue he's really glad that actions are taken instead of complaining about the way the system is thank you blue would love to connect with you i'm i'm pretty sure he will he's a he's a fantastic he's a fantastic <laughs> person and entertainer of that so great artist so asya thank you so much we've already extended it by a couple minutes but i regret not a single second i really enjoyed today so uh thank you so much for being such a graceful guest speaker we wish you all the best with first boulevard's efforts and of course just like i said if we can locally connect you to anybody who could further the cause i'm only one call away awesome thank you philippe thank you for having me on and thank you net guru for hosting these talks thank you so much and everybody see you next tuesday on the next episode of disruption talks bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.